this video it goes back and and kind of answers questions from some previous videos and updates some data from some previous videos. So because of that, it's going to run a little long, but to save you some time, since you probably don't have questions on everything, down in the description there will be a uh, section where minute by minute it'll tell you where your topic of interest starts. So you can just fast forward to that section. Main thing was people wanted to know what is this stuff? Now, V E R A N D A, veranda, you can get it at any Home Depot if you go to the help desk and tell them exactly what you want. It's hard to do online, just go down to the store and say, look, I'm looking for the veranda, you know, sheet PVC of this dimension. And uh, they assure me, whether it's true or not, I have been assured that if you can buy it at one Home Depot, you can get it at any Home Depot. Now, those of you living outside the United States, don't know what to tell you. If you have a marina or a chandlery or something nearby, um, Starboard is a very similar product, if not the same. Um, a little more expensive, uh, but a, a good product nevertheless. Similar properties. Now, how to tell whether it's some some people are asking how how do you know if it's foam or if it's um, solid? And the easy way is the, the price. Solid will be three times more expensive. So a regular four by eight sheet will be close to $100 right now. Uh, it went up recently. Um, and of course the solid PVC will be a lot more. And it'll also be about three times heavier. So if you just pick it up off the rack, you'll know instantly, you'll go, oh, you know, th this is way heavier than I was expecting. Um, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying one's a lot cheaper and you know that goes a long way with me uh, but on a small piece like he has a but you're gonna have a bunch of small pieces does it even matter probably not but if you want to know how you can't tell by the way because they're too small it's like there's no way to tell without a scale and you know but anyway um, but what you can do is run your thumbnail along the edge if it's cellular your thumbnail will dig in a little bit and it'll, you'll feel some traction there. And if it is not cellular, if it's actual solid um, PVC board, your thumbnail will just whoop, slide right along. It won't get any traction. So there's a quick way, if you needed to know the difference in a small piece, that there you go. Um, now, uh, I kind of illustrate how how it's cellular because it doesn't look cellular on the surface because it's not it's got the skin the skin on it is either textured or, or flat but it's continuous it's, it doesn't have holes in it think of it like a coaxial sewer pipe where the the there's a cellular core but the outside and the inside are smooth now this is a good illustration this is this is a hawk that we made a, a mortar hawk for scraping when you're putting uh, air creep mortar on bricks you want something to hold it on and scrape it off of. Now Air Creek mortar has sand in it so it's a little bit uh, more abrasive, considerably more abrasive than regular Air Creek. So um, this hawk has been used extensively and it's worn out. See how it's smooth around the edges? And it's not smooth in the center? And it, this is a great illustration of the little pits in the, and there's also scrapes, but ignore those. So we're looking just at the little dots that, that constitute the pits. The, the cellular nature of it um, enables the darker colored aircrete to fill in and make a good contrast. So if you want to know roughly the structure of the interior, that's about what it looks like. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all we have to say about that for now. You may have other questions, I don't know yet. Um, other people find it difficult to make those little clamps. I do too. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty exacting. And once you've made them, um, they're only really good for that particular mold. They, they may or may not fit other molds, because we're just not that precise in the field. Um, and I, I didn't mean to imply that that's the only way to do it, or even that's the best way to do it. Just that you could, if you only had a router and a saw and a sheet of plywood, uh, I'm sorry, plastic, that you could make everything you need to make a form. 
not necessarily the best idea. I don't even think it is. I like to use ratchet straps. And I particularly like to use stainless steel ratchet straps because I live in a very, very moist environment. In fact, if you think Seattle's moist, think three times or more as rainy as Seattle. And that's Hilo for you. Now this is stainless. This has been in use for about a year. This one is not stainless. And it has also been in use for a little over a year. And it is still barely functional. In another year it'll just be a ball of rust. This is a typical use of a ratchet strap on a mold. Now when you do this, you'll probably find that in the short dimension, it provides more than adequate clamping pressure. But in the long position, the long sides, it may not be adequate or it might even cause a little bit of bowing to happen. So to prevent that, it's wise to stick a piece of lumber in there to give it additional inward force on the sides. And that should generally be adequate. The same thing can be said for the inserts. Um, you can make it completely out of plastic, as, as I showed you uh, earlier on. Uh, but it's definitely not the easiest way to do it. Um, and uh, if you have a sheet metal shop nearby, it makes a lot of sense just to go down and pick up a length of this. This is a 10-footer for about $15. And you can see they even put that little step in there that I like for reasons that I mentioned in the first video. So, um, yeah, and it's a lot easier to make the slots. You just zip them across with the, uh, the skill saw. Now I made this for the Kahena Beach uh, workshop. And as you can see, it's very dome guy in size in that it's about a foot deep, as most of his are. Uh, and it's got little saw cuts along the edge for you to put like dividers in there. Now this one isn't really set up for the steps. You could use them, but it's not set up for it. What it is set up for is making both kinds of blocks. In the long dimension here, you can use that for making the doorways and entrances, the way they use the longer blocks. And as you can see, you can either make them four inches thick, in which case you can make three at a time, or six inches thick, in which case you'd make two at a time. And along the edges, it's also set up for either four inches or six inches or eight inches thick, or even a foot, if you so desire. It is important when you're sourcing these type of dividers to realize that there's a great range of prices available. Um, the first one I went with was a heavy gauge stainless and had that little Z kink in the middle. And a piece about that, about that big was $120, which was pretty bad. Um, and so I had to come to grips with the idea that not everything needs to be stainless and not everything needs to be that, that sturdy. Uh, these dividers are just separating concrete from concrete. And uh, so this painted metal stuff works just fine. And um, if you don't put the little Z-kink in it, it's even cheaper. So yeah, do shop around a bit. Um, but uh, in essence, uh, you don't have to pay much for these dividers. Another question I get is about the columns in the backyard and um, whether or not they're aircrete and whether or not I make the molds. The answer is they are regular concrete and I do not make the molds, but the molds are available through historystones.com and they look a bit like this. This is the base or when you get to the top, you turn the last one over and make it into a capital and then in between they have a, a cylindrical mold with various inserts that you can use. Um, and the reason I make them out of concrete is these don't really lend themselves well to aircrete. And the reason is mostly because of all, all these little nicks and crannies here. And as you can see, this was last used for aircrete just as an experiment. And it, as you can see, it's still got aircrete in it. Now I left this aircrete in the mold for a very long time because as you know aircrete gets stronger with time and even at its very best pieces of it chipped off and you have a less than perfect product which is fine if you're making ruins but otherwise you're going to have a lot of patching to do and i just don't think it's worth it it's really not 
that much more expensive just to make these out of concrete. You know, get a couple bags of quickrete and you're golden. Uh, so again, HistoryStones.com, pretty fair product. I haven't worn any of them out yet, so I'm going to say that they do last a long time. And yes, I will make a video on how to do those. I've already shot it years ago. I just never published it for any, for some reason. Um, so yeah, I'll piece that together and that'll be in an upcoming video. Okay, and that brings us up to the hard facing. Uh, there was something I said wrong in there. It didn't seem to be wrong at the time, but mathematically it was wrong. Uh, when I lifted the brick out of the mold, I said it doesn't add any weight or appreciable amount of weight to the brick. Um, it adds, uh, mathematically, half of, of a 60 pound bag would be 30 pounds. So it add about 30 pounds to the brick. Um, the reason I didn't notice was because the brick was still wet. It had only been in the mold uh, about three days. So it was still had a lot of water weight in there. So uh, when it dries out, it's more noticeable. If you pick up a dry, hard-faced brick and a dry one of the same size without the hard facing, the you can tell which is which. I mean, without even looking. Um, so uh, luckily, I found out that a quarter inch is fine. So you, you can put on a quarter inch, and only that's ten pounds to the brick. Doesn't make that much difference. I mean, it's a wall. You don't need it to be that light. It's theoretically got a foundation under it to hold it up. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm going to modify that to say it adds about 10 pounds. In the hard facing comments, I noticed that some people were assuming I was going to make a dome um, out with this stuff, which is not the case. They, these bricks are very much too large uh, to be using on a, on a dome. Um, and it's good to know that not all aircrete has to be a dome. You can make vertical walls of aircrete, and that's fine. And that's what these are. These are just, I'm going to go out to the old farm and I've got a slab out there that I'm going to put a building on. And it's going to, the walls are just going to be this hard faced aircrete. And it will most likely just have a conventional roof on top. Although I haven't ruled out like a, a vault of some kind. Um, at any rate, um, another question or, or, or comment I saw, it's not pertaining to my bricks obviously, but other people were talking about how they did like a textured face and it cracked off. And this is actually kind of to be expected. Um, concrete has no natural um, adhesive ability. That's why you can pour a tilt up wall on the foundation. I mean, you just pour it right on the floor. When it's dry, you tilt it up and it doesn't stick to the foundation because it, again, it's just not the way concrete works. So in order to make something stick on after the fact, you have to put um, like wire or something, nails and whatnot, to get your fascia to stick. That's why I prefer to put it in wet and wet. That way, uh, as, as the concrete hydrolyzes, both the aircrete and the fascia crystallize together. And that, that keeps it from falling off. And believe me, uh, I've done the tests. Uh, I can show you some in the back where I've broken up some of these to see and the fascia is very, very strongly attached to the back. It doesn't crack off, uh, which is one of the advantages of doing it my way. So that brings us up to the last video prior to this one, which was the pumping video, how to pump aircrete, in which we used a diaphragm, a uh, manual diaphragm bilge pump to pump a cubic foot of, of aircrete up to a roof uh, form. And I promised the data for that when we have it, and now we have it. The cured block is 25 pounds, which is 5 pounds too heavy. We expected a 20 pound uh, block, and if it had been anywhere from 19 to 21, I would have said, you know, close enough for aircrete, but it's not. It's significantly over. So, what we're going to do is go back and do it again, but this time. Uh, have two molds, identical molds, one on the on the ground and one on the roof, and pump them both out of the same batch, so it's exactly the same. So we eliminate any errors that way, and then we'll compare the two weights after they're cured and see which one, uh, see how much is lost. I'm pretty sure that some of it will be 
Um, and, and that way we'll know what we need to do to compensate, which would be a future experiment. And the way that would work is we'd compensate by seeing how much more it weighed. That would tell us how much we lost in the process. And that way we could add that much more bubbles prior to pumping. So if normally we had a four cubic foot mix, we could maybe make a five cubic foot mix just by adding more foam. And then when it loses a certain number of bubbles, it might come out just perfectly in the final um, thing. But that is exactly the sort of thing that we're here to find out. And um, so at some point in the future, we'll do that.